and Terry Shatzberg. Are you sitting here? Where? This one. Mm -hmm. get that. that was fun, huh? <laughs> Jerry, we, uh, you've been here a few times before. Yes. Uh, not just with this movie, but with uh, your first movie. I even come to see other people. You do? Oh, yes. He's, a, he's a, actually here quite often. But we showed your first film several times, Puzzle of a Downfall Child with Faye Dunaway. And your, it's not your sequel to this, but your follow-up to this with Al Scarecrow, which was a big hit here. We've shown Paddock several times, and we will be talking to you about that. But because this is a New York series, we thought we would show a selection of your New York photos which you started taking. When did you start taking photos? Um, Hold I the think mic in up. the early 50s. Hold the mic. I think in the early 50s. And uh, I didn't really start taking professional uh, photographs until I was 27. So uh, that was uh, a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, 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 did, you weren't interested in taking pictures as a kid? Of the kid? As a little kid. No. This is something you... Oh, I had a little plastic camera. Everybody had a little plastic like camera. Like a brownie. But, uh, do I, do I, you want me to go through the whole thing? No, no, but let's start, <laughs> let's, let's shoot, yeah, we want to start with infancy, but let's, uh, <laughs> let's see some of your photos. Okay. If this is going to work. Is it on? There we go. No, I just went. This is why we're opening out of town. No, we're in town. Okay. <laughs> it's not projecting. Okay, then let's. You'll have to stay. That's all. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's talk about the movie then. Well. Spencer is uh, figuring this out. Uh, was Al your choice for Bobby? Yeah, I about uh, four or five years before I did the film, I had seen Al on stage. I was I was a photographer, and I went with my business manager who wanted to sign Al up uh, as a client. We went to see him in an Israel Horowitz play. I think. Um, I forget which one. So, the Buffalo in the day. I think no. Israel Horowitz's grandson is here, right? No? Son. Uh, Son. Well, what was the name of the play, Buffalo? The Indian Wants the Bronx. Indian Wants the Bronx, right. yeah. And uh, I was just flabbergasted. He was so fantastic and he's so powerful. And uh, we went backstage to see him after, and he was this pussycat. He's just a sweet guy. And. Um, from that point on, I said, if I ever made a film, that's the guy I'd like to make a film with. And about, um, then I went off and I started to uh, develop a film, Puzzle of a Downfall Child. And um, I had uh, met Faye Dunaway and other people, and I was starting to uh, get a little bit of a name because uh, we, we'd take pictures of aspiring models. You know, and. Um, through that, you get, you see, you get, they get people see you, and uh, I know uh, I did that for a couple of years. You did that for more than a couple of years. You were, you were one of the top fashion models. Around. No, that, that's before I be, before I had my own studio. Right. Before I became okay. a photographer, while well, I was working for another photographer. I see. And um, I also had to. Uh, I had an uncle who worked for a, a diaper company. And, uh, <laughs> they they would. Um, if you rented your diapers from them, you get a free picture. And uh, I, he, he, he took me out with him once, and he sold about, um, you know, you get full commission if you sold $9 worth of films. He sold $30, $40 worth of films. He, he didn't know what no meant. He just kept on talking as if he was the only one in the room. But uh, I said, I, I don't really want to do that. Who takes the pictures? He said, well, that's not a good... Uh, Deal. There was not too much money in that. I said, "How much is it?" You know, they uh, they offered me 
the job, a job for twenty-five dollars a week. I couldn't take it. I was married, had one child, and one on the way. But uh, I, uh, I said, "But who takes the pictures?" He said, "No, that's not, not a good deal." I said, "No, I, I'd like to." They, they told me what I had to do. I said, "David, that's what I like to do." So I borrowed some money from my mother, bought a camera, very expensive camera, because they, they insisted on using certain cameras. And um, I uh, had to learn how to use the camera, how to take pictures, they showed me. And you go into um, the house and they, put, they have a table, you put up a screen and you lay the child on the stomach and you fold their arms like that, they can't, they can't break that. They don't have the strength. So you see most of those baby pictures, you see them laying in the sun like that. And uh, they take the pictures. And uh, I, um, then, then uh, but, but I realized that you go to the first place, it won't let you in because the baby's sleeping. You go to the next place, it won't let you in because the baby's sick. So you end up doing two sittings a day and, uh, it didn't pay very much. So I, well, you started as a baby photographer, yeah. in other words. <laughs> and from there you went to high fashion. I don't really, I still don't understand it. How it well, no, I, I, I just um, went to a, a, a um, I saw an ad in the, in the paper. I was actually in the fur business with my family. I hated it. So I had to get out. And I, But I saw an ad in the New York Times that photographer's assistant wanted. And, um, I called this number, and I told uh, and I told this guy. Uh, I told him my name. I told him my history, and he started laughing at me. You know, he just wasn't impressed with what because I had no experience. <laughs> so uh, he said, "Well, I don't know. But come in. I'll see what I can do." I went in there, and there was this very nice man, one lame arm, and uh, he uh, he still was laughing at me, and. Uh, he said, okay, I'll send you out and we'll see what we can do. He sent me out to a very uh, wonderful photographer, Lillian Bassman. I don't know if you know Lillian, but Lillian's a wonderful photographer. She and her husband both. And, uh, but they, they couldn't offer me more than $25 a week and I just couldn't do it. So I went to do baby pictures for a year and I uh, hated it. And finally I, <clears throat> I went back to him and he sent me out again after laughing at me, we went to another photographer who I got the job. I got the job probably because um, there were three people before me and we didn't know when the photographer was coming because photographers are not very dependable all the time. So uh, he said, he, she, uh, they, the stylist told the first three to go out for coffee and then we'll send next year. They went out for coffee and two minutes later he walked in. I was lucky. Hmm. and. Uh, he asked me how much I wanted. I probably told him forty-five dollars a week or something like that. He said, "I think I'm going to hire you." <laughs> that, um, didn't impress me, but I, but, but I went off again to sell my pictures at night. And he did call that night. And I thought I lost the job, but I call, uh, the next day I called, and uh, I got the job. After three weeks, he wanted to fire me because I, I just knew nothing about the, uh, the cameras. We used big cameras. And uh, finally, uh, his stylist said, come on, Bill, he's, he's only had three weeks to a break. I uh, decided I was going to learn, and I was with him for two and a half years, and he offered me a piece of the business when I was telling him I was leaving. And, uh, so that was all right. What was his name? Uh, Bill Elburn. Bill Elburn. Elburn. So we have some of your pictures from the early 50s. When did you start doing street photography? This is. Uh, your picture, the real. Uh, he insisted on me giving him this picture. <laughs> oh, no, you gave it to me. Uh, but but it, for me, it does have some significance because I named my company Rialto Pictures after this theater on seven, it's 7th Avenue and 42nd Street. And it's a beautiful picture. When did you start doing photography like this? And was this for, for fun or for hire? No, I, I really wanted to learn. When I went out with the camera, I, I just, it just really impressed me. Uh, and I, I learned how to do this. And I was determined to uh, get this, get a job like this. What kind of camera would you have used on well, a picture it, like this? This time it was um, either a Rolleiflex, which is the camera I bought, that my mother gave me money to buy, but I wasn't taking those baby pictures anymore. It's either a Rolleiflex or, 
maybe an icon. This picture has so much detail. You can see all seats, 53 cents. We can sh start charging 15 yeah, of three. But I just love that. I think, huh? I think every time I went out, I could almost see a film. You know, I, I would start to talk about a film. I had one photograph where there's a, a, a guy who's hawking uh, uh, newspapers, and the, the headline on the paper where he's got folded over and he's holding it up says, uh, Tommy Dorsey found dead. And I used to go see Tommy Dorsey because I loved Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra was playing with him. You worked in Times Square, didn't you? Yeah, I was uh, worked with Sheffield Milk Bar. I used to make juice and coconut juice and all that. And, uh, yeah, but I used to go see, in the morning or when the show was open, I used to go see uh, Frank Sinatra At sing. At the Paramount. At the Paramount. Which is right near here. Yeah, and uh, one day, um, I look up and there's Frank Sinatra with a, a buddy of his. I couldn't believe it. And I made a, a, a drink for him. And about 40, 40 or 50 years later, I went to his uh, 80th birthday. And I, he was going around like the father of the bride to tables. And he stopped at my table and I said, you know, we know each other. We met a long time ago. <laughs> and I told him the story about making him a coconut drink at the Sheffield Milk Bar. And he laughed and he said, oh, I gotta tell that to, what was his wife's name? Barbara. Barbara, I gotta tell yeah. that to Barbara. I doubt he ever told it to Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> you can see Lowe's stayed here, all the theaters that, that were in Times Square and those days in the Bond clothing store, the famous sign. This, I love this. I think this is the Criterion Theater on Broadway. Showing the country girl with big No, clothing. this was on 42nd Street. This is on 42nd, on 42nd Street. Street. Okay. Country girl. I, used to, I love the displays. Were you were you fascinated by movie theaters? Why? Oh, yeah. Well, I, used yeah. To, I used to go uh, to uh, the movies probably three times a week. I'd go uh, Friday night with my father and mother if she was available. Saturday, we had a cleaning lady. After she finished uh, cleaning, she would take me to the movies. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and on, sun on Sunday, my mother and father took me to the movies. You were born in the Bronx, but you grew born up in Bronx. Queens? No, no, I was born in the Bronx. We lived in one, two, three, four different places, and then we moved to Queens. Do you, you remember the movie theaters you went to? Lowe's Paradise in the uh, Bronx? Well, in the Bronx was Lowe's Paradise and the Divan. The Divan was a small theater thing on Tremont Avenue, and uh, I'm sure, because we only had that one theater, and then we had the big one up on, at the end of the concourse, and after a reading about Stanley Kubrick, he lived not far from me, so I'm sure he and I sat in the same cinema all the time you in Stanley different Kubrick, places. You and Kubrick have kind of parallel lives. Yeah. You were born around the same time. Mm -hmm. You both started as photographers. He's know. older than me, isn't he? He <laughs> born the same year. <laughs> I, I, I love the fact, look at all the cigarette butts on the sidewalk. There's something we don't have so much anymore. Here's another thing. Now this, I think, is the Lowe's Victoria. Yeah, but uh, this was on Broadway. On Broadway, right. Yeah. Lowe's Victoria, yeah. which yeah, was right next to I like this picture. Yeah, very much. Uh, seeing the repeat of the name of the film, one of my favorites. And this was also playing at the Paramount at the same time, so it was a big was hit. It? Yeah. Oh. I love this picture. This is Times Square looking north. That Budweiser sign can be seen in Sweet Smell of Success. It's where Coca-Cola is. Nice. Well, you know, this is what we're doing. This is what this series is all about. The city. <laughs> the Hotel Edison, which is still there today on, I think, 45th. Where is it? And, Jerry, you would like this. The, you have a billboard for Basin Street, one of the 52nd yeah, well, Street Club, one of the places you would have gone to. So Ellis playing there with Slaughter and Finnegan. There's a Miss Wrangle there, I love that. Actually, uh, I used to go to, uh, when I started to get successful and have a little money, I used to go to Birdland all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pee Wee Marquette, he was the uh, major <coughs> day for the place, and he'd always just recognize me. Like, I'd recognize Bruce when he comes to, well, what's the restaurant we just Bar served? Pity. Bar Pity. <laughs> but, uh, and he'd take me to a table right in front, um, Right under the uh, bandstand, bandstand. Yeah. <clears throat> and I went. I'm going to see Miles Davis once, and I would be there all the time when he was playing. 
and I'd be looking up at him, and he'd always be arguing with the guys in his band. <laughs> and uh, this one time, he uh, he just left the bandstand, left him there, and I was a little bit disappointed. But I saw that a friend of mine, Chico Hamilton, had come into the theater and walked over to the bar, and I got up to walk over to the bar and say hello, oh, Chico, and because uh, we are very good friends, and. Uh, Chico said, oh, you, uh, Miles, you know Jerry Schatzberg, and I didn't know him at all, he didn't know me. He looked at me and he said, yeah, I know that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Chico is in the first film he showed in the series, Sweet Smell Success. He's the combo in Sweet Smell Success. So this, I think, is the Bowery under the Third yeah, Avenue yeah. album. That was before the tour tour down. Yeah, which was... This was the last L in New York, I think, and I, they tore it down by the late 50s. So this is around 1954, I think. Yeah. This again is the Bowery, I believe. Do you think? No, that's on the L also. Yeah, Third Avenue L. Yeah. Is that your car now? No. <laughs> but again, the Bowery is still the lighting district. These are beautiful. Love this. Yeah, I like this picture too. This is what the subway used to look like. <laughs> well, I remember the wicker chairs from when I was a kid, but by the time I was a kid, they were all vandalized with the springs yeah, coming and they, up. and they took them out. They took them out they, and they replaced them in plastic. Some, they have some in their museum. Oh, it, the, it, the, the transit museum yeah. has the original cars. But this is Ralph Avenue in, the, in Brooklyn, I, but you were most attracted by his socks, right? Is it? Well, no, recently. Yeah. I was really attracted by that, and also, uh, I don't know if you have one of the uh, ads that, are, that were in the subway for maybe Well, you yeah, have some ads. What, I, what yeah. I really like, I had a, an assistant uh, a little while ago who had a pair of socks like that. And I didn't know that, I didn't realize that. And I saw the socks, his socks, which was, you know, 19, 2017 or something, and uh, that was, that was somebody was wearing them back then. This man's way ahead of his time. I guess this is the A train. This is, I guess this is the A train. This is going to Washington Heights, 207. Okay. I can't see that. This is beautiful, Grand Central. Look how spotless the platform is. <laughs> now this is, of course, not staged at all. This photograph. <laughs> I think this is your most famous fashion photographer. Uh, well, I hope not. I've got a lot no? of photos. <laughs> well, for me, it is. Where did you find him? Central casting, the guy in the room. Well, he, he walked by, and I said, I've got to take this picture, and he wouldn't stop. And I had a, my camera, and I just had to keep walking back until I was able to take two or three shots. He wouldn't stop for me. He just kept on working. <laughs> she's a, a well-known model, yeah? She's the, she's, the, she's the model that I based my first film on. What was her name? Saint Marie. And St. Marie. Who was really uh, wonderful for me. I, I, she used to work a lot for Bill, and we became good friends. And uh, so puzzle. She, she said, you know, anytime you needed some help, I'll be there. And she was. You know, if I'd call her, she was always there to do a photograph for me. This is, Lindsay and I determined that this is Fifth Avenue Fifth and 35th Street. Street. Yeah. Probably that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, a lot of fashionable people running around the streets in those days. Yeah. <laughs> like at this, Wall Street, Trinity Church. What, what magazine were these done for? Vogue. Vogue. I, uh, I uh, you know, when, when you were an assistant, you were able to uh, get models to work for them. I think they needed photographs and you needed photographs. and. Uh, I was building up quite a, a collection, and there was another photographer working for Bill, and he was wonderful. He he, he worked the dark room, but he did was shooting at night. We were Bill gave us the opportunity if we wanted to work for him, so long as we'd be available. And if he needed us, he let us use the studio at night. He let, let us use the studio film cameras and everything, so it was a great advantage. And when he started, Jack had been taking pictures for the studio for the uh, model agencies and he said to me I'm going to start you up but I'm not going to give you the best agencies because I want, I want you to get started and get, get used to it and he was right and I was able to build up a nice little collection but from those 
they would take the photographs around and other agencies would see them and then they started calling me to uh, take pictures. And uh, I think this one was, you had a studio on Park Avenue Park South Avenue in 25th? 25th. So this is right across from your studio. Metro, that's the Metropolitan Building. The Metropolitan Building. I don't know if you can make out the taxi. It says 25 cents for the first quarter <laughs> mile. Well, I want to do a show of my, uh, um, I've done a lot of beat dancers, and uh, I, I named that last photograph uh, <coughs> um, Taxi Ballet or something like that. <laughs> and uh, I want to do a, a show of all my dancers, and that'll be the main theme of it. But he, had, he has a Ouija in his hand? Oh, well, that's a glass he's window. Wa oh. He's washing the windows. Oh, I thought it was and a Venetian blind. No, it's or no, no it's, it's not. A, yes, a window. Another guy, okay. another guy under there, and he's on the ladder. Oh, I see. And I just yeah. waited for a taxi to go by, and I just. There you go. That's cool. This is a very poignant photograph, mislabeled in your contact sheet as as Grand Central. It's Penn Station. This is Grand Central. I approve. I approve. I approve. Well, look at the ceiling. Here's a picture you did not take, Jerry, 1911. Penn Station. <laughs> look at the ceiling. It's identical. It's, it's Penn Station. And what's poignant about this picture is that this was torn down the following year. What do you think? I promise you. I'll even bring in my niggas where it says okay. Grand Central. All right, well, it's either Grand Central or Penn Station, but it's still a point. It. it was taken at 62, and Penn Station was torn down the following year, okay? Right. I love... <laughs> this is Harlem. This is Harlem. And, it's uh, a pawn shop. I, uh, I was asked to do uh, uh, photos of uh, Rod Steiger and uh, Sidney Lumet, who were doing uh, the pawnbroker. Mm -hmm. So I asked uh, Rod if he would come up to Harlem with me to uh, a place. I just want to see him hang out. Is that Rod? That's Rod. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I don't think so. No, Rod is the same. You got to bring the negative. It's not that safe. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. You don't see but, but I don't think um, I was very friendly with Faye Dunaway at the time, and I don't think. And I said, I had done a film with her. And I was asked by, um, I don't remember who, but they asked me to photograph this making of the film. And yes, I went there, and he was not very nice to me. Who, oh, Rod? Yeah. Oh, he was. No, not Rod. Rod was fine. Sydney, Sydney was not. Because, really? I think it had to do with knowing my friendship with Faye. Oh, I see. You know, he was, he was working with her. He had worked with her. So he just stayed off. I only stayed one day, and I left it. You know? oh. Beautiful picture. This is the late '60s, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was doing a, a series on the man from Uncle, and uh, I just wanted to get some more interest in it, so I just had uh, different. This is 1964. Like this. Uh, so who is that in the well, wheelchair? Well, that's not them in this picture, but in some of the uh, the series they were. We had Robert Vaughn and, Robert and, uh, and David, David McCallum. And David McCallum met a woman on one of these cities who was shooting for about a week and he met the other model that I was working with. He married her, he's still married to her. And uh, I saw him maybe a couple of years ago and he said, good marriage. Very nice. Who are these guys? Um, uh, some guys from England. <laughs> so what was this taken for? This, they had a, 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 a song, a single, um, Can't You See Your Mother Standing in the Shadows? Right. And uh, they asked me to figure out a cover for them. So I dressed them up this way and I made them American because this building I found around the corner from where I, my studio was looked just like the building I grew up in with the star in the window and all that. So, and and the, most of the fun was dressing them. I mean, they, they wanted to wear the underwear and everything. <laughs> we also photographed the Beatles. Oh, yeah. But we, when was that? Was that... Uh, before them. I, the Beatles I did before them. Who was that? I did them a magazine Hall, or And then I did them... Uh, and then I went to London and photographed them in London. Okay, this is, uh, this is taken from an undisclosed 
location? It was Grand Central. (laughs) 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 But actually, it was my apartment I shot this one. And this is later, this photo. This is uh, when 1972. Uh And you're still there? Well, I shouldn't tell people where you live. (laughs) Well, I'm not there anymore. Oh, don't. Then I started taking street stuff this looks older than it is this is the early 70s or when is it it's, this is actually well, you know, we do have some older streets yeah. here still you do in New York yeah this is actually I, I, I can tell you from the negatives what they are but I couldn't tell you from just looking and this is one of my favorites nice. This is Rockefeller Plaza in the. Uh, now, I, this is downtown, but is this west side or east side? Because the park I, on the east side has been wiped out. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't tell you. You know, I was, I was always walking around in those places. That's not the ship you were on in the Navy. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this woman, and I didn't believe it. She uh, just reached into a bag and pulled the snake out. She didn't know I was taking her picture, but I couldn't resist. And uh, just sat there and playing with her pet snake. <laughs> and this is uh, not her pet snake, but this is a blind villain. So you were actually almost the unofficial photographer of Dylan. Well, I did a lot of work with him. And you photographed the blonde on blonde cover. Yeah. Which is, by the way, was out of focus. Did you know it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it. The way I know it is that Richard Prince. You know Richard Prince? Yeah. Uh, do you know Richard Prince? Yes. Yeah. Sure. And Richard Prince copied that photograph. And he didn't go, because he, he usually copies people's work and then puts his name on it. So he, cop- he copied it. <laughs> And he t- all he did was make it a little more out of focus. And we uh, put our lawyers together. And, uh, That's great. One. He's, he's lost a lot of cases. He, he, he seems to be a, a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, this is Spruce Street. All these buildings are gone now. There's a Frank Geary skyscraper where that is right today. Yeah. But I'll take a, his word for that because yeah, I don't know. It's not Penn Station, that's for sure. <laughs> anyway, that's a selection of Jerry's photograph. <laughs> uh, if you want some time, you can come by the studio. I've got about 2,000, uh, 100,000 more photographs there. Well, that's next week. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's get back to Al. Uh, you wanted Al, the studio did not want him. No. Coppola wanted Al. Coppola wanted Al. I had already shot, uh, just finished shooting Panic in Needle Park, and uh, they and Coppola had seen what I'd seen on stage and all that. But he kept the studios kept saying, "No, no, we don't like him. We don't want him." They screen tested him four times. And Coppola called me and asked me if I had some pictures that he could see from Panic in Needle Park, and I said, "Yeah, sure." So I gave him. I thought I gave him about 20 minutes. He claims, uh, they claim I gave him eight minutes. Doesn't matter. He got the part from those pictures. But the studio resisted him. They yeah. didn't. They wanted a bigger name. He they was, said they said he was too old. He was 31, looking 12. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find Kitty? Kitty, I, I told the, my producer. Producer was um, John Dunn, who was uh, no Nicholas Dunn. Uh, John Dunn was his brother, who was married to Joan Didion. So they were the producers of uh, of uh, Panic, and uh, they were staying in hotels and doing research and getting all that on. And uh, they, uh, I'd so I, I told Nick what I was looking for because I wanted somebody that was absolutely not from the neighborhood for anything. And he was out in California, and he saw a, um, he went to um, some show, a show com- a company up in San Francisco, and he saw this person, he, he called me immediately, he said, I think I found her. I said, we'll see, I'll come out and we'll see. And I went out there, and she was 
just what I was looking for. He found me. He did find what I was looking for. And she had never been in the movie? No. Well, yes, she, she had very small parts in a couple of Billy Freakins. Uh, no, that was at The Exorcist. No, she was came at, back and did the, that she, after. But she, she, she was, was in, in an earlier yeah. Freakin movie. Yeah. Okay. And she won the Palm d'Or for this. For this, yeah. For and then she did Exorcist and then... She, and kind of, she just retired. She retired. We've had her as a guest here a couple yeah. of times. But I, 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 I talk to her frequently. You know, we talk on telephone. Yeah, uh, I, I just don't think it was her, um, her thing. But um, I, uh, I want. I had a uh, there's a, a nude scene in here. Right. And um, she kept putting it off. She kept putting it off because she wouldn't, well, I, it was written into the script. And I asked her when I went out to California, I said, well, how do you feel about that? She said, what nude scene? I said, well, it's written in the script. She read it. She said, oh, I'm going on holiday. She went on holiday, and she called me from there, and she says, no, I think it's all right. It doesn't bother me. And every time I try to book it, she would have some excuse of why she couldn't do it. And uh, I said, Kitty, we've got to do it now. You know? <laughs> uh, and uh, we set it all up. We cleared the set and everything, and uh, we shot it. Very good, and I, I couldn't I couldn't think of her walking around with a towel or covering herself up. She's she's got a lover with her. She's not you know. So um, and um, she um, she she was very uh, uptight about showing it to her uh, grandfather and uh, her grandmother, and uh, she kept carrying on about them. And then I found out her grandfather was General George Marshall. <laughs> but we got the film anyhow. Any questions from the audience? I have a question. Okay, wait, well, for, more, wait for the microphone. Okay. Actually, I really, I really wanted to come to say hello. We met many years ago with Gene Garlando. Oh. And I was his friend, and I think he might have done the titles for this film. Am I right, um, right or wrong? Gene, Gene Cook. He usually did some things for me. I don't know if he actually did the uh, titles because we, we, we had to have that done by a union person. Oh, but I he see. did he did work for me. Yeah, Gene was a great pal. Yeah, yeah, he was a long time friend. I, I think it was he that sort of saved my life when I decided to leave the fur business. He was working for a small agency and he kept giving me jobs. He was a great man. He was a great guy. Yeah. Nice to see you again. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Uh, over here. Hi. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your experience as photography came to Say that again. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your experience in photography has impacted your directorial style? For instance, like the blurring and like some of the early shots in Panic and also in some of your 1950s street photography seems to kind of overlap. So well, I, I think every time I went out with my camera and I look at something, I mean, like uh, when I when I saw a woman with the snake, I, I started to think, how can I use that in a film? <laughs> but uh, I think I think I was thinking that way all the time. Uh, so I, and, and when when um, when they offered me Panic, I turned it down because the lab had scratched the last six minutes of my negative. And I wasn't used to that, you know. Uh, he brought my film in, my assistant would pop, uh, re uh, re process it, and, and I was on, on my way. But here they, they scratched the last six minutes of my negative, and I didn't know what, what to do. I didn't want to. And then they sent me a pack at Eagle Park, and I turned it down. Mm -hmm. And then I went up to my business manager's office, and he said, you know, there's a good script out there. I said, what, what, what's it called? He said, it's called Panic in Hill Park. And I said, Marty, I think I uh, read that, and I've turned it down. He says, why? He said, uh, I said, well, you know, I just don't like that business. You know, they scratch your negative and they don't care. And they just <laughs> he said, uh, and then we talked a little bit. He said, you know, Hal is interested. <laughs> I said, because I was saying all the time, if I ever did a film, I'd want to do it with Al. So I said, oh, so I went back, I read it that night again, I called up the producers the next day and apologized, and, and we started to work on it. And then I think that's when they said, uh, yeah, at first they said, okay, to Al, and then they called and said, no, we, we, we'd rather get somebody younger. I said, oh my God, you know, how much younger? You know, he looks 12 the way he is. <laughs> and uh, then they finally came around.
back here. Thanks, Bruce Renberg. Um, Jerry, so Woody Allen said that he uh, doesn't really want to make films that much anymore because of the state of film today, which is no longer like really going to the theaters, but goes straight to, to streaming. And I remember your time, films would stay around for a very long time and they would win the Oscar and the film was still being shown. And now everything is pretty much straight to streaming in two weeks in the theater. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I've really not thought of making any uh, films. If I, if I find something that I really love, then I'll put the time in and do it. Because I, I, I do these shows. I do, you know, I just came back from Canada with another show. And, uh, you know, I'm getting on. And uh, I feel I don't have to do films. If, but if I found something that would I'd love, I would then work at it. Because, you know, it, it's difficult. All the uh, studios have hired different people. They were all connected with television. And I was, you know, I was dealing with people that were connected with filmmaking and studios. And I didn't really want to start over. Panic, how was it received when it came out here in the States? Well, in certain areas, it was received quite well. Um, it was banned in London, in England. Um, I don't know why, uh, but, uh, but, it, it, but but none of my films, except for the thing I did with uh, Alan Alda, made money. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. This, all, but this were, was actually really well received in Europe, particularly in France. Uh, Scarecrow. Well, both Panic and Scarecrow. Well, yeah, because the, the, both of them were chosen for the Cannes Film Festival. Well, Scarecrow, well, Kitty won the pa her best actress at yeah. Cannes, you won the Palme d'Or for Scarecrow, Scarecrow, correct? Well, they're a different audience. Yeah. yeah but uh, the, the money doesn't come from those audiences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> questions? Actually, two questions. The first one is like the first one is was there a photo essay about Panic and Neil Park like in life? I just remember being like ten and seeing a photo essay and I'm wondering if those were your It was photos. based on a magazine oh, what, 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 It was a magazine article, right? It was, no, it was based on a um, let's see, uh, it was book first it was a book. Then it was um, um, sort of a documentary talking about it. And what was the author's name? I forgot. Um, Mills. Mills. James that's right, Mills. That's right. Yeah. And but it wasn't a photo, like New York Magazine. It was like a, in like Life Magazine. Life it was like a photo essay, and I think. I remember that. Yeah, too. I think that was later on. Okay. That was my first question. My second question was about the, the style of the film and. Because it's so free, and I think we're so used to seeing movies that look like that now. But I think in '71 it wasn't so common. I just wondered what you were influenced by, and was like do in, uh, documentary filmmaking. Like what what helped you create? That well, sort of I'm very sure I was influenced style. by documentary filmmaking, and, and it's also the way I like. That. I can't uh, I can't bear uh, seeing people really act the way they used to act. You know, so I give uh, my actors that freedom. And I remember. Um, we, uh, it was getting it was getting good word. I mean, people people around were seeing it and liking it. And Otto Preminger heard about it. And Otto Preminger, Otto Preminger did a, 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 a film on drugs. Uh, what was the name of it? I don't remember. Oh, Let's not see. the such good friends. No, no. Man with the gold. Man with the, oh, the older one. Man with the golden and, arm. Yeah. Uh, so his, his people called and asked if they could uh, if he could come and see the film. We said sure, absolutely. You know. We, so he came, he, he came to the seat, and he, we sat in the back, the film was, was over, he got up, walked out, didn't say thank you. Daryl Zanuck saw it too, he's the head of the studios, and he was an old school guy. Well, Daryl Darryl Zanuck, well the film was done by uh, Fox. Dick. Yeah, and his son was his one son of the producers, was, was Dick Zanuck. Yeah. The, and, and they fired them in the middle of, not my film, but the middle of while I was in the middle, and uh, he uh, he called me in to talk to me. He told me he had seen all the dailies. He, he said, even, even though he was retired, he would look at all the films. And he told me he really liked what he saw. It reminded him of one of his early films. 
exactly who which one. Could have been anything. He wrote hundreds yeah. of films in the early but, days. But he was very supportive. It's unusual for a, a studio film to have no music track also. Was that your decision? Yeah. I, uh, I hired somebody, a uh, uh, contemporary composer, and every time I put a, uh, a, a, put a piece in that was written for a certain amount, I hated it, so I just kept pulling it out, pulling it out, finally I said, no, this, this film doesn't need music, the street is the music. Question back there. I have two. Uh, how did you capture the junkie behavior so well? And with I, I, I hired ex junkies. Oh. Uh, most of them were, had been junkies, but I told them nobody, nobody's going to shoot up or anything in this, otherwise you're out. <laughs> I did find out uh, after we finished that one of um, one of my actors was hooked on drugs. Wow. And uh, they kept it quiet and. Um, and he's a wonderful actor, I won't tell you who, because I disrespect his uh, thing, but um, I, 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 I felt that, because I, I, had, I had them shoot up in the film, I mean, how, how do you how do you get the experience if you don't see something, you know, feel it? And so I just told them, we, I think we shoot up two times in the film, that they have to see it and, and, and just feel it. Small question, what was the donut shop that Helen worked in? Where was it in the city? Um, it's on, uh, on that. I don't think she worked in that one. That's where they used to hang out. I, I can't really tell you. Was it Greenpoint? Yeah. Greenpoint? No, it was in New York. Everything was shot in the city, yeah, except for Staten Island. Staten Island, fair. Was that really a dog you threw over the fair? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Four or five dogs. <laughs> Heartbreak. Okay. Next. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, what was it like working with the actors on set? And do you have any like specific memories of like writing a scene or rehearsing a scene? And, yeah, you could share that. Um, I've done 12 films, so uh, I can't say it. Well, you know, this was a special film with drugs, and drugs are involved. Al's experience was with his family. Somebody in his, somebody in his family was a, an addict, so he, he was able to use some of that in his uh, working. But um, they, they were all, at one time, hooked on drugs, and they would give me advice whenever they thought I needed it. Um, I would take it very joyfully, but I can't. I can't think of uh, scenes that uh, you know. You, you always have something. I could tell you. Once uh, I was um, getting ready. Huh? Close. I was getting ready to uh, shoot a scene uh, with uh, Al and Jean. And uh, when they when they came out, I said, you know, I think we're going to eliminate a lot of this dialogue. And uh, Gene said, oh, fuck, and he was starting to walk away. I said, hold it, hold it, what's the problem? He said, nothing, nothing, let's shoot it. <laughs> well, what, what's your problem, you know? So he said, he said um, well, let's talk about it. Let's go in the alley. So I said, okay, we'll go in the alley and talk about it. He said, he comes along with us. I said, yes, he comes along, come on, Al. In the alley, and he starts to say, "I'm sick and fucking tired of you guys deciding at night what my dialogue is going to be the next day." And I was absolutely wrong because I saw by the way that we operated that I was not going to socialize with Al or with Jean at night. They had their own way of doing it, and I didn't. And, uh, and Al, of course, through this whole thing, he's very quiet and he doesn't uh, carry on that way. Maybe he does now. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> we, we, we finally got to, we finished uh, the argument, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had purposely took t taken them into this alley so that we wouldn't be seen by the rest of the crew and the rest of the uh, actors, and uh, I decided to, well, you know, I'll shoot it the way it's written, and then I'll take it out into the editing room. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I just did it that way, and I did do that, but... Um, I figured I was being very 
discreet, and then I found out that both of them were mic'd, and everybody on the you know, Oh, wow. <laughs> the trailer was listening to kids, wow. everybody was around listening to everything we were saying. We have time for Hi. maybe two more. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask how... Maybe two uh, more. Okay, as many as you want. It's okay. <laughs> I wanted to ask um, how involved you were in the, in the editing process in this movie. And how much that changed throughout because I, and that, that's my pleasure because I, I'm there every day uh, everything and, and I listen to them they're the professionals and if I liked it it went that way if I didn't like it we talk about it but uh, on all my films uh, I uh, pretty much got my way and I, I don't know if you saw Street Smart if you've seen Street Smart with Morgan Freeman yes uh, I I wish I could uh, just get to those guys that produced it and take the last scene out. I hate the last scene. <laughs> <laughs> why I left it in, but it would have been so much a better film without that last scene. It was produced by two legendary producers, Golan and Globus. <laughs> <laughs> and tell them about when you arrive on the set. Of, it was supposed to be New York City. But no. He, he didn't want to shoot in New York City because it was too expensive to shoot in New York City. So he sent me to Canada, to uh, Toronto actually. And uh, I, I looked around Toronto, Toronto and I couldn't see anything but mountains. <laughs> Everywhere I turned, I saw mountains. So I said to the guy that was there, representative, I said, no, no, let's get out of here. It's not the, for us. I went back to the city and uh, Globus, I think, called me. Said, What's the matter? What happened? You know. Well, I didn't see New York City up there. He says, well, what's wrong? A big city's a big city. That was his, I said, no, not for me. So we went to, and I went to Montreal, and I found more New York in Montreal than I did in uh, Toronto. I just, I just except except that. for, uh, if you, in the first scene, if you look out, look out the window, there's a big a sign on a circular thing that keeps going around like that. And I found out, after one of these uh, Q and A's, somebody from Canada said, "You know, you made a mistake there because that's a sign of a big department store from uh, from Montreal." <laughs> so, uh, so if you ever it see it, don't don't tell me. About that's it. why it's not in this series, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry, just a follow up to that about the editing of this film. Was it seems like a lot of the scenes are kind of cut into the middle of a scene. That makes sense. And I was wondering if oh, that was yeah. I mean, written into the script or if that I, was something. I, I, like I, no, I, I think I take a lot of uh, uh, chances of some of those things, and I, I like it that way, you know. But uh, we we had we had enough footage to uh, really cut it any way we want. And the way you see it is pretty much the way we saw it. One more. One more question. <laughs> No, I'm fine. Okay. More questions? One more. So, I have a question about... Um, Wait for it. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Um, Al and Kitty are so physically comfortable and intimate with each other. I'm just wondering if how you achieved that, if there was a rehearsal process or something like that. Say that again? Uh, if, how did Al and Kitty achieve the level of intimacy and, and comfort they have with each other on the screen, if there was rehearsal? Maybe a before? Oh, yeah. But... Uh, we had, uh, luckily, we, I mean, uh, it would have come out good no matter what, because they're both professionals and they're both wonderful. But we had, um, Al wasn't shooting anything, so we had about two months to hang out together before, and, and that way, we, you know, we became very good friends. Al went right from this to Godfather, is that right? So, Okay, would you like to ask? Oh, yeah. Okay, up front. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, your film is one of the reasons I went to art school, uh, so this your, uh, your work is so powerful. And I want to say, um, uh, well, two things. One is the... I find this film is, was so honest is what struck me always. It's, it's so honest, and it's honest... Uh, it ends with that ending. It's 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 so brave to make an ending that no one dies. You, you know, a film like that. It's it's. I I almost wonder if it could be made anymore because it's not a happy ending, but it's 
it's so genuine and so sincere. You know, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure whether it could be made or not. There, there was a, a very nice film done by the Softy Brothers, by the Softy Brothers, but uh, it, it wasn't really um, scripted that way. It was just really showing two drug, drug addicts. That it was, you know, very nicely done. But and, and uh, Josh always said that I influenced him on that, and I was happy when somebody says that. But. Uh, I, th I think uh, if you look at my films, you'll see, with the exception of the one with uh, Alan Alda, but when I was able to, because he wrote the script, and they, his manager was the producer, so I, I had troubles with uh, with him. But uh, but uh, there's wonderful scenes in in that with um, what's her name? <laughs> oh, that's not, not Susie Barbara. Kurtz. Susie yeah, yeah. Kurtz? Huh? Yeah. Not Susie Kurtz. What's no, her the first film? No. Oh, Barbara Harris. Barbara. No. Barbara. No. Not, not Barbara Harris. No. Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep. Mm. She was great in that bedroom scene. Mm. But she was she's a great actress. And also, I want to say the the opening credits, the choice of p placing Pacino and Wynn together in the, as in the cast of the, in the opening credits, and then ending with them leaving together. I thought it was like. It was brilliant. It was just it was perfect, and it, and it you know had you isolated both of those names, it would it would have changed like the feeling. See if he's got any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your moment. Well, I think that's a good way to wrap it up. Okay. Thank you very much.